we're back. We're back with Dragon Plus, our uh, next live stream in our uh, Dragon F uh, Plus <laughs> weekly series. Sorry, we were uh, talking about the questions that have already started to come in on chat. Uh, today we will be speaking once more with Jeremy Crawford, as always, lead rules designer of Dungeons and Dragons, lead designer of the Player's Handbook, and the game's managing editor. All still true? All still true. I had a, a rapid-fire series of questions <laughs> to, <laughs> to, uh, to start things off. Uh, we're going to finish up our, uh, this is our third session on the order domain. So who knows how long it's going to take to get through centaurs and minotaurs. <laughs> We'll get through the order domain, lickety-split. <laughs> uh, so first off, Jeremy, what are you reading, watching? What are you playing these days? I was just curious. Read, reading, watching, and playing. Okay, yes. I'm always reading a lot uh, and often very uh, historical things. So, mm. for example, last night's reading was I was reading all about the Cathars from medieval France. Ah. Uh, they were crushed. Uh, in a grand inquisition, uh, and so I was not only reading about that history, but also about their beliefs, because mm. uh, they were they represented a, a reflowering of ancient Gnosticism. So that's how I amuse myself. <laughs> 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 and and uh, let's see, playing. I finished last week God of War, so because of that, uh, I uh. returned to uh, Nino Kuni Two mm -hmm. on the PlayStation Four. I'm always playing Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> so That's I, the correct answer. <laughs> I have I have a session of my home game coming up this Saturday. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so over the course of the evenings this week, I'll be getting ready for this Saturday session. And if the scheduling gods are kind to us, we'll be having a session next Saturday also. Okay. I say that I say that because given how busy my group is, we're lucky if we get more than one session a month. So getting two <laughs> sessions in one month is like, oh my gosh, Christmas came early. <laughs> uh, and then watching uh, the show I'm watching right now and loving is Netflix's The Crown. Oh, okay. Uh, which yeah. I know a lot of other people they, you know, they've already watched all the episodes. I came to it late, yes. and I'm loving it. Shelly's watching that herself right now. Oh, it's so, so. good. All right, so there we go. We, uh, we can neither uh, endorse nor uh, denigrate any particular product, but uh, just curious what's going on in, in the world of Jeremy Crawford. I, I can confidently say I like all of the things I just, did, <laughs> I just mentioned, including <laughs> reading about the Cathars. <laughs> there you go. Uh, and a couple weeks ago, we did mention uh, watching Infinity War. Yes. Uh, and so we were not going to get into I think that people have either seen it at this point or they've already been uh, familiar with the spoilers. Uh, but just out of curiosity, if you were going to assign Dr. Stephen Strange a, a class and a level, what would he be in a D&D &D campaign? So I am a big Doctor Strange goob. Yes. I may have mentioned that on Dragon Plus before. <laughs> it, I've, been, I've been reading Doctor Strange since I was probably like six or seven years old. So about as long as I've been playing Dungeons and Dragons. Mm -hmm. uh, so really it would depend on at what point in Steven's life we're talking about. As the Sorcerer Supreme later on when he becomes the most powerful wizard of the entire Earth dimension. Yes. In D&D terms, he, he's easily 20th level. And as far as his class goes, the closest fit really is wizard mm. because at least in the comic books, you don't see this as much in uh, the cinematic universe, but in the comic books, very much like a D&D wizard, he learns spells from ancient texts. Mm -hmm. I mean, we do get to see that a bit in the Doctor Strange film. Yeah. But even more than that, in the old comic books, like a D and D wizard, he is often casting spells with like somatic gestures. Like anyone who's <laughs> seen Doctor Strange, know he's often making these whole Got to make little circles, yeah. Uh, and he's often also uh, reciting magic words. So also has a verbal component. Yeah. Uh, and he had these often, you know, little rhymes where he's talking about the mystic moons of Munapur and the crimson bands of Sitarak. The crimson bands, by the way, showed up in Infinity War. So I was sitting in my seat going, yay, <laughs> there are the crimson bands. The, my dad got me hooked on Doctor Strange. He just had a file cabinet full of comics. It was Batman and Doctor Strange. Mm -hmm. And the, you know, Batman I could grok 
superhero. Doctor Strange, I was reading that. I was like, what is this? <laughs> was, I, the Jack Kirby art, it was just something I had never seen before in, in, in comic yeah. books. Well, and the, uh, Steve Ditko is mm -hmm. the one who did uh, uh, all that the early trippy. Oh, maybe that's who I'm thinking. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. All, all the trippy early uh, Doctor Strange art yeah. where he was traveling into other planes of existence. Mm -hmm. Also, again, actually very much like a a D and D wizard, uh, which isn't surprising because first edition D and D uh, and those original Doctor Strange comics uh, back in the '60s kind of arose. Mm. At, they they both arose out of the same cultural soup because yes. uh, in the '60s and '70s there was a lot of fascination with Eastern mysticism, right. with magic, uh, out of body experiences, yes, things of that nature. Exactly. Yeah. All right. Well, let's uh, let's dive into it. We owe some folks some uh, further discussion about uh, recent unearthed arcana material. As mentioned, we're going to wrap up really quickly with the order domain uh, before we move on to this week's minotaurs and centaurs. So, uh, the order mm -hmm. domain. Uh, we did have one more component to look at with orders wrath. I believe, uh, and yep. seeing how that finally changed from beginning to end. And then as, as mentioned, we do go through. Uh, if you do have questions, please preface them with question in the chat. Uh, we will try and catch them with our uh, mortal eyeballs. But if not, we go back through the, the, the chat log and uh, write them on down. So we do have some questions uh, that came from, from last time as well. Uh, so, uh, why don't we, should we look at the Order's, Order's Wrath first? Let's do it. Okay. So, so how, what was the original version mm -hmm. that came across, and then why and how did it uh, develop? So, not a whole lot changed uh, in functionality between uh, the original draft of Order's Wrath and the version of it that showed up in Unearthed Arcana. Uh, the main thing that we changed is in the original, there was this reference inside Order's Wrath, not only to you using your Divine Strike, but then your allies gaining the benefit of your Divine Strike. Mm -hmm. Now, the problem with that, as a little bit of rules writing, is it's actually not entirely clear which parts of Divine Strike your buddies were getting to benefit from. Uh, you know, and what was there a limit on how often uh, they could benefit from it. There is a limit built into Divine Strike where it says once on each of your turns when you hit a creature. Totally unclear in the original draft of Order's Wrath uh, whether that limit applied to your ally, uh, etc. Mm -hmm. So what we did in the the version in Unearthed Arcana, and that's the, we're looking at that on the screen right yeah, now for folks. That, yeah, the uh, one on the screen. The one in the screen is the Unearthed Arcana version. Uh, no, no. Now it's <laughs> now it's the original version. Oh, so, no, we, sw we switched. But <laughs> okay. So now, this, so here's the original version. Here's the original version where it says your allies gain the benefits of your divine strike against that creature whom you whom you just applied your divine strike damage to, mm -hmm. and they gain it until the start of your next turn. Again, too vague. Uh, so if we now switch on screen to the new version. Uh, it says, if you deal your Divine Strike damage to a creature, you'll notice there, we also made a little editorial change. The previous one talked about applying your Divine Strike damage, whereas on our rules, we will almost always say you deal damage. Um, then we say that creature takes an extra 2d8 force damage the first time each turn that any ally of yours hits it with a weapon attack. This benefit lasts until the start of your next turn. Uh, admittedly, this is a little complex in its wording. If we were now to take this through an editorial pass, we would simplify this a little bit, probably break that long multi-part sentence into two. But this new rule gets the uh, intent across, which is you, you hit somebody, you use your divine strike on them, dealing its damage to them, and then until the start of your next turn, uh, any time one of your allies uh, hits that person with a weapon attack, they get to deal 2d8 extra force damage, but your ally gets to do that only the first time on any turn uh, when they hit that creature. So again, functionally the same, but it's clearer mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the technicalities. 
but it could definitely uh, be even simpler to understand. And that's the kind of thing we would refine in an editorial pass after uh, playtest feedback comes in. OK. Uh, so hey, we've, we've, we've done it. We've gotten through the, the order time. Yes, yes. Uh, we do have a couple of questions. We were very, for... we were very orderly, appropriately yeah. <laughs> enough, <laughs> about going through the order domain. So, so we did have a couple of questions from last time. I didn't want to uh, pass them by. Uh, so just kind of throw them out here before we move on. Mr. Dash had asked, when designing a spell, because we were speaking of uh, sleep spell in particular last time, how do you determine which spell school it belongs to? So the school of magic of a spell is really based on the effects of the spell. Just you look at, hey, what does it do? Uh, if it summons a creature from someplace else, that's conjuration. Mm -hmm. Uh, in fact, if it involves really moving almost anything around magically, instantaneously, like teleportation and whatnot, that's conjuration. Uh, if you're transforming uh, a body uh, or an object in some way, typically, that's going to be transmutation. Mm -hmm. And so you just go down the list. You, if you go into the spellcasting chapter in the player's handbook, there's a description of each school of magic and you just match it up as well as you can mm -hmm. uh, to uh, the school with the right description. Now, sometimes uh, it can be difficult, particularly when it comes to, let's say you have a spell that deals necrotic damage. Mm -hmm. Often, thematically, that's going to be a necromancy spell. Right. But it might in the story of the spell have nothing to do with the undead or death. So it is theoretically possible to have a spell dealing necrotic damage that might actually instead be an evocation. And evocation is sort of this catch-all school for it just a spell that deals with raw magical energy. And that's why evocation is home to not only a number of the game's damage spells, but is even home to a number of the game's healing spells, because it's all about channeling directly this raw magical uh, stuff and, and, and creating these, these effects. Uh, do you care in any way about balancing out the different schools, about which schools have more spells or more powerful spells, or is it, it doesn't matter, it's just which one does a, a spell appropriately belong to? So when we were designing the player's handbook, the spells available to each school were important to us from a balanced perspective, but not balance in the sense of counting up the numbers of spells and making sure each school had the same number. Right. We're almost never interested in that kind of symmetry in our game design. What's far more important to us is that each school is able to fulfill its story mm -hmm. is able to fulfill its place in the worlds of Dungeons and Dragons. It's able to do the things you would expect that type of magic to do in this sort of fantasy world. And then we would make sure that the iconic spells within those categories were really hitting those marks. You know, we made sure Fireball was as fireball-y as it could be. <laughs> uh, Similarly, you know, we made sure that the divination school had some really juicy options for people who want that kind of magic. Same with illusions. Uh, you know, go down the list. We made sure each in each school there was some really attractive option uh, that pulled its weight. But again, each school is going to pull its weight differently. Uh, the divination school, uh, just one example is rarely a school that a person is going to go to if they're looking for a high damage spell. Uh, we would expect them to go to a school like Evocation uh, if damage is what they're all about. But if a person is really uh, looking for magic that's all about information gathering, about playing a character who's a seer or you know, a soothsayer or the classic wizard or druid who is an advisor to a, a queen or king, uh, then the divination school uh, is a place where you're going to find that kind of magic. And if I'm looking for a good party school, <laughs> Par <laughs> or, <laughs> so if, so for parties. Oh wait, that's how I chose my. my <laughs> <laughs> not that kind of school. But if you do want magic for parties, I recommend the illusion school. Okay, yeah. <laughs> because because <laughs> then you can make some wild things happen and be experienceable, yeah. but not have too many regrets the next day. All right. Yeah. So that illu the illusion school is <laughs> perfect the if you're at the party school. <laughs> 
<laughs> uh, let's ask a couple more really quick. Uh, Strider, what is, why, sorry, why is full class design not uh, archetype design so difficult? Great question. So designing a class uh, from the ground up uh, is, it is difficult, but it's also something we're just simply cautious about. Mm -hmm. And uh, as, as any of you who've listened to the last couple episodes uh, with me and Bart have already heard me go into, and I've gone into this in videos and at conventions, so much of our design is about story. Mm -hmm. And each class represents an archetype. Uh, and it represents not only an archetype that is a, a collection of various game mechanics, it represents a story in the fantasy worlds of Dungeons and Dragons. And if we introduce a new class, that class has got to occupy an archetypal space similar to the classes that we already have. That said, not even the classes we have occupy the same archetypal space. For instance, we often think in the game of the game really having four foundational classes. Okay. The rogue, the fighter, the cleric, and the wizard. Mm -hmm. There are so many character types that you can create just using those four classes. Mm -hmm. and, and honestly, uh, you could strip away all of the other classes in the game, not that we would, but you could, <laughs> and have those four classes and it would still feel like Dungeons and Dragons. Yes. Because those are the classes that have been with us going all the way back to basic D&D. &D. And so there are other classes, like the, the Barbarian, for instance, that represents a narrower archetype than, say, the Fighter. Because quite honestly, you could actually build a a warrior using the fighter who thematically feels like the barbarian. Right, uh, just gets furious and, yeah. and goes to town on his enemies. And, and so really often what we're looking for if we consider making a new class is we're wondering, does this new class fulfill a big enough archetype space mm -hmm. to, to be justified as a class? Or is it so narrow that really it belongs as a subclass? Uh, inside one of the archetypes we already have. Uh, now, once we've decided, okay, this is a big enough archetypal space to justify creating a whole new class, yes. it's then a challenge uh, to get things just right uh, because each class has its own internal balance. Uh, and we want to make sure that if we're designing a new class, that it isn't just a reskinned version of a class we already have. We want it to have something about it that is distinct mechanically, in addition to story distinctiveness. Uh, and then we need to make sure that it fits into all of the things we've already designed for the game. Not, not quite as difficult for us if we're designing a non-magical class. But if we design a magical class, then we have to decide how it interacts with our spells, if at all. We have to decide how does it interact with magic items that already exist in the game, some of which have specific spellcasting classes as prerequisites. Mm -hmm. um, so there are a lot of decisions that have to be made if a new class suddenly is going to march uh, onto the scene. Uh, and so we're cautious. I mean, it took us three years uh, to refine the classes that are in the 5th edition player's handbook. Now, of course, during that three years, we were also designing the rest of 5th <laughs> edition. Um, but it, it, it took us a while. And, and because a big part of that uh, is also getting feedback from uh, the audience and seeing what it is you like, seeing what it is you want, what feels right for you at the table, what's fun, what's clear. Uh, what more would you like to see? So there's also a long conversation uh, that a new class sparks. So let me ask about a new spell casting class. And this had been brought up by uh, uh, quite a few folks, uh, I, I believe last time we were talking to Jeremy. Uh, the Witch, your thoughts on the Witch as a separate class? So the Witch is something we discussed actually as a part of our fifth edition design. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, it wasn't a direction we decided to pursue because we felt, looking at the folklore of our world as well as the stories of various D&D worlds, we realized that when people say witch, they mean many different things. Mm -hmm. Sometimes when people say witch, they actually mean hags, which are monsters in, in Dungeons & Dragons. 
Other times when they say witch, they really just mean a type of wizard, mm -hmm. or a type of sorcerer, or a type of warlock, or even a cleric, or a druid. Other times, uh, some people in our world, when they say witch, they actually mean a practitioner of the religion Wicca. So it, that word has many meanings for many people. Mm -hmm. uh, it can also mean uh, the witches, whether malevolent or benevolent, that we associate with Halloween, or that we associate with the Wizard of Oz. Or if you're from Italy, it might be Bafana, the witch who brings gifts to children uh, <laughs> at Christmas time. Uh, and, that one I didn't know. And uh, and so it is a word with many, many meanings. And honestly, in English, it used to be that sort of the root for the word witch was really, really meant basically wizard. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, even more specifically, uh, if you go back to the word sort of Old English roots and you go through sort of its Germanic origins, it also was associated with divination, mm -hmm. with soothsaying. So quite honestly, you could build that kind of really old world wit witch right now uh, with a wizard uh, having divination as your school. Uh, you could even pick the cleric, actually, because clerics have a number of divination abilities. And witches in some folkloric traditions are heavily associated with healing magic. Uh, you could uh, also use the druid uh, as the basis for a witch. I say this because one of the one of the stories I love from Irish mythology, uh, there is there is this description of all of the warriors before the great battle of Moitura, and. It goes through essentially description, uh, in addition of the warriors, of all the spellcasters mm. uh, who are helping in the great war against the Fomorians. And it talks about this magician who's going to hurl a mountain down on people. So it's basically, oh, there's a wizard. Then it talks about the druids, but the druids in Irish myth are actually associated with divination and causing a rain of fire to come down on the opposing army. So really much more what we would call clerics in Dungeons and Dragons, and druids also in Irish myth uh, were priests. And then there's this group uh, who's, you know, who's come up to, to bring their magical power to help called the witches, and their magic, how it's described, is they will cause the trees and the rocks to animate and attack the other side, which in D&D, we call that a druid. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it, it's funny, when you look at Irish mythology, it's like, it's, it, like compared to D&D, it's like we got it tangled up, because really <laughs> what they call druid in D&D is much more a cleric, and what they call a witch in D&D is essentially a druid. I'm going to have to pick your brain for sport sources after the show, because I've been dying to find good Irish Celtic mythology that kind of walks through a lot of it. I, it's <laughs> very cursory, or it's very dense in a way, but something good and readable. So uh, if, if any of you listening are interested in Irish mythology, one great uh, old-timey introduction to it mm -hmm. is Lady Gregory's book called Gods and Fighting Men. Mm -hmm. uh, it's from the uh, 19th century. That title should be a giveaway that it's from the 19th century. <laughs> or a uh, supplement to the uh, early edition of Dungeons and Yes, Dragons. yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and and that book includes this episode I'm talking about uh, where you get the description of all the spellcasters. And by the way, not to forget, it also includes a description of the bards. Mm. Um, and it's actually that description of bards that was partly the inspiration for us having the spell Vicious Mockery in D&D. &D because one of the powers of the bards in that story is it says they put satires upon the opposing force and those satires drain the opposing force of their bravery and then the bards uh, sing inspiring songs and it fills uh, their allies mm. uh, with bravery. Mm. Uh, all right, no. So that's thank you. I've got I've got that one now. So, I, and so be, beware. I could talk. I could talk because <laughs> this is the kind of stuff I read for fun. <laughs> well, I think it's great stuff. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, speaking of words and uh, origins, uh, this week we had uh, minotaurs, the bull from the Isle of, of Minos, and the centaurs, uh -huh. uh, which <laughs> derives from. I have no idea where a centaur. The word uh, would actually oh, derive. Oh, so so 
it's funny, we were just talking about Irish mythology, and so great segue actually to the centaur and the mintar, minotaur, uh, because they are both from uh, Greek mythology. Which you can find no end of sources for. Yes. I, I, yep. w I want that for Irish mythology. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, it, it definitely, it is sort of like uh, Greek mythology has uh, <laughs> co colonized the Western mind when it comes to ancient myth traditions. Yes. Uh, but yeah, I cannot recommend Irish <coughs> mythology enough uh, or uh, Norse mythology. Uh, oh, yes. Yeah. And uh, Neil Gaiman just has a, uh, yes. a recent book out uh -huh. that uh, is apparently very, very readable. Mm -hmm. uh, again, we are not making a uh, recommendation, just an observation <laughs> of uh, <laughs> products that exist in the world. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, what am I talking about? Appendix N and the Dungeon Master's Guide. They listed out books that you should, should Yes, read, which so. we also, yeah, we did in the, even in the 5th edition Dungeon yep. Master's Guide. Yeah, so oh. there you go. We'll have a li living Appendix N. Uh, yeah. I think that's the right appendix. Yes, so. yeah. Uh, so uh, we've got uh, Minotaurs and Centaurs to, to start talking about. Uh, should we throw up the, the latest version? Did you want to look back at the prior version of the Minotaur from... Uh... Oh, yeah, so a little bit of background for, for those of you who might not know. The the Minotaur, we actually explored back in 2015, mm -hmm. and it was specifically an exploration of the Minotaurs of Kryn. Right. And what we decided this time is we wanted to revise it a bit based on feedback we got, but also make it so that it would work for really any playable Minotaur in any D&D world, and specifically Minotaurs who have escaped the demonic influence or just avoided entirely the demonic influence of Baphomet. Because the monstrous Minotaurs in the Monster Manual are associated with this dark lord Baphomet, <laughs> and that's why they, you know, they're savage and evil and, and, and whatnot. Uh, whereas these playable minotaurs uh, are not uh, in the shadow of this demon lord uh, in the same way. Uh, and they also have physical differences. Those bestial minotaurs are large, whereas uh, these playable minotaurs are medium-sized. Yeah, I'm smiling because I know that's a question that's come up a lot, a lot, <laughs> especially when we get towards the center. Yes, yeah, yeah, and we could certainly <laughs> talk about that. <laughs> so really, really with the Minotaur, uh, if we take a look at the old one, um, you'll see that not a whole lot has changed between the two versions. Uh, one of the things we did do is, uh, rather than having a a choice. And so we've got the, the this is the original version uh, from the Waterborne from 2015. Adventures. Yep. So if we scroll down, Pelham to the to the Minotaur. Keep going. Let's get to the racial traits. This is the challenge of uh, using these as images. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Here we go. So the the Crin Minotaur had conqueror's virtue, uh, where you get to pick. Uh, one of your ability score increases. Here's the thing, and, and honestly, I have to say this has been a bit of a surprise. This is something we've experimented with a couple of times now, uh, giving this kind of choice in uh, a race option where you get to choose uh, one of your ability score increases, and it has generally not been liked uh, in playtesting. Of course, there are people who like it. There always are. You know, there are some people like everything, uh, but. More people have disliked this approach than have liked it. Um, I think the, the feedback we get is that it often feels too much like a, a, an enticement to min-maxing, mm -hmm. uh, and people often like the, the traits to be more straightforward and, again, not, not sort of be this carrot to say, all right, now min-max me. So uh, a min-maxitar. A min-maxitar, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> that would be next on Earth Arcana, don't quote me, the maxitar. Uh, <laughs> right, yeah, there's two, there's two sides to this. To the In contrast to the minotaur, the maxitar will, will also not be large, won't be huge, it will be gargantuan. Sure, yeah. Yes, we're going to go all the way to the other end. And every ability score increases. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> All right. So you'll see that uh, the Minotaur now uh, is even stronger with a, an addition of uh, their strength is increased by two uh, in the new one. Their constitution increases by one. 
Uh, in both versions of the Minotaur, both the Crin Minotaur and the Minotaur we released this week, the Minotaur is medium. And I'll talk a bit more about size uh, as, once we wrap up about the Minotaur and I start talking about the Centaur. Uh, you'll see the speed is the, ch is the same. Uh, now, once we get to the horns, you'll see here's where we started making some adjustments. Mm -hmm. uh, in, the, in the Dragonlance version that we released before, uh, the Minotaur's horns dealt 1d10 piercing damage on a hit. Uh, we found that that was going overboard and that it was sufficient to have that at 1d6. That's still a decent weapon, essentially, you always have on you. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and as a natural weapon, as opposed to being an unarmed strike, uh, it means you can use it with things like the Paladin's Divine Strike and whatnot. A little bit of design background I can give you. We considered making the Minotaur's uh, horns as well as the Centaur's hooves use usable as unarmed strikes, but we instead went firmly in the direction of them being natural weapons uh, so that they would interact uh, with various abilities in the game uh, that require a weapon of some kind, and mm -hmm. specifically a melee weapon. And so these natural weapons uh, work very nicely with them. And we felt that thematically that was a far better fit than saying Minotaurs and Centaurs are amazing at Kung Fu. Uh, so, and, <laughs> yeah. and, and again, this is... Now, I've seen Kung Fu Panda. They, yes, they can. yes. <laughs> and here's a great example of how our design is always a mix of uh, story design uh, and uh, game balance mm -hmm. and editorial and writing because there would certainly be nothing unbalanced about making these usable as unarmed strikes. But we felt, when essentially when we're lining up a species archetype with a class archetype, we start thinking, what feels more natural? Do we want the Minotaur to really shine as like a paladin mm -hmm. or a monk? As a fighter or you know something else? Right. And we sort of, we go down the list and we start, we start making connections rarely meant to force you in a particular direction, but to suggest a partic particular direction. Because often people uh, gravitate toward class and race options in the game because these different story possibilities are, are calling out to them. Uh, also, we got rid of the statement in the old version that said the Minotaur was always armed, or the way it was worded before was, you are never unarmed. Uh, we, th 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 this was, a, this was a, a level of specificity we did not want to maintain, uh, caused some weird rules interactions, so into the dustbin it went. Uh, you'll see that Goring Rush uh, works similarly. Uh, it's still an attack with your horns as a bonus action, but here, uh, we clarified the wording that this bonus, bonus action occurs immediately after you use the dash, dash action on your turn and move at least as far as your speed. I bring up that last bit, move at least as far as your speed, because the original design of Goring Rush, actually when I read it, made me giggle, because it says after you take, after you use the dash action during your turn. Well, here's the thing. The dash action doesn't actually cause you to move. <laughs> so this is like a, a one-inch punch sort of uh, possibility where I'm not really going anywhere, but I still get the full benefits of, of ramming you with my horns to full effect. Well, it, because it, yeah, it, it's like goring rush. Yeah, you, you edge forward an inch. <laughs> when really the intention of the design was you actually dash at the person. So this is a great example of when you're writing rules, you need to make sure they actually say what you mean them to say. Uh, and that, so that meant adding in that not only are you taking the dash action, but you're actually using the movement that it just gave you. You're going and dashing. They, yes. They're part and parcel. Exactly. Yep. And to make sure the timing was, was crystal clear, uh, it is immediately after you use, that all happens because we want you to come in and, you know, kapowie. Mm -hmm. All right. Hammering horns. Uh, the original hammering horns was also a bonus action. And 
so already that's a little bit of a red flag for us when we start piling people up with options that are all sort of competing for the same uh, bonus action or reaction on your turn. Uh, also, the original hammering horns uh, relied on you looking up the shove rules in the combat chapter of the player's handbook. Those shove rules which allow you to either knock someone prone or push them back five feet, mm -hmm. yet hammering horns said, hey, go use those shove rules, but you can't knock the person prone. So, so look up this rule, but there's a but, caveat to it right, <laughs> right there. So that, for me, in rules writing is a no-no. Mm -hmm. Don't Basically, don't make somebody go look something up, but then tell them, <laughs> oh, but ignore ignore part of what you're, you're reading. Yeah. Unless, so, you know, again, exception. This is a game of exceptions. <laughs> Unless what you're talking about is, like, there's a whole half page of rules, and you're only changing one little bit of it. Mm -hmm. But if you're taking half the thing away, why not just tell the person how their ability works right here? And so that's what we did with ham with the new version of Hammering Horns, where we don't make you go look up uh, the shove rules in the combat chapter. We just tell you, immediately after you hit somebody with a melee attack as part of the attack action on your turn, you can attempt to shove that creature with your horns using your reaction. That creature must be no more than one size larger than you and within five feet of you. And then we tell you right here, it must make a strength saving throw against this DC, and if it fails, you push it five feet away from you. Now, there are a few, some interesting things going on here that I'll, I'll pull the veil back on uh, for you all. First off, if anyone takes a look at the shove rules in the player's handbook, they, uh, yep, are you, you're gonna look, good. <laughs> You'll notice that the shove rules in the player's handbook uh, involve an ability check contest. Uh, the, the, sh the person who is shoving makes a strength athletics check, and this is opposed by the target's strength athletics or dexterity acrobatics check. Now, that works fine for a rule that is meant to be used by everybody. But you'll notice that... <laughs> I, that I'm, I'm just uh, yes, checking your work. You have covered the shove rules uh, quite nicely. Oh, thank you. Yeah, please, please <laughs> check me. Make sure, I, make sure I, I'm getting the rules right. Strength athletic check contested by the target's strength athletics or dexterity acrobatics check. There you go. Um, that rule is meant essentially for anybody to be able to use and for non-specialists. But you'll notice that most special abilities in the game, whether they are class features in the fighter, uh, or they are spells, or they're monster abilities, when they do this type of thing, where they clobber somebody and then hurl them back, mm -hmm. usually it's a saving throw. Mm -hmm. And part of that is because saving throws are faster uh, than having two people rolling against each other. But also, there is actually a loophole in the shove rules. And I've talked about this publicly before, so this will, probably won't be a surprise to uh, uh, all of you listening, that the shove rule fails to account for the fact that the person you might be trying to shove could be unconscious, could be otherwise incapacitated, and the shove rule doesn't say, mm. do they have to be even the awake to, to make, make this check? Yeah. Uh, whereas the saving throw rules and the various mm. conditions in the game, they clean all of this up. So that was also why I personally did not want to send you to the shove rules. <laughs> I was like, I'm going to have you make this roll again and have the other person make a saving throw. We avoid all of those issues. So just to kind of, I guess, encapsulate some of what you're saying from the perspective of a class design for folks that are interested in designing their own classes. It sounds, correct me if I'm wrong. Or here. races in this or, case. Right, sorry, mm -hmm. races classes. Uh, keywords are, are useful for a reason. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, if there are um, modifications to the keyword, maybe maybe that's not the correct thing to be applying here. It's and, and by keyword, do you mean like a rule elsewhere? A, a rule the, elsewhere, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then, uh, do you do you prefer designers to use saving throws over contested rules, or is it? Uh, it depends on what's it, really being designed. It contested uh, ability checks are best left to non-combat situations. Mm -hmm. uh, attentive readers will notice that we very rarely, after the publication of the player's handbook, use contested roles in combat situations. It was something we were experimenting with in the PH, 
and have largely phased out. Mm -hmm. We still use them quite a bit in non-combat situations uh, because they're a great way to resolve uh, things like you know arm wrestling or a duel of wits. Or, right. You know, Clearly, I won't thing. choose the glass of wine in front of you. Because, uh, <laughs> right. That, okay. Yeah. Whereas once you're in the realm of combat, almost always best to rely on saving throws and attack rolls uh, because the system can deal with those things in a very clear way. Now, there's another little twist in the new version of Hammering Horns that I wanted to point out, and I know some people online have, have spotted it, and that is uh, Hammering Horns now eats up your reaction uh, rather than your bonus action. All right. Now, part of this is, going back to what I said earlier, is I didn't want two things both leaning on your bonus action. Mm -hmm. uh, now, the other thing is, and the, again, this is open to playtest feedback. <laughs> this is why we do things in Unarked Arcana. Which is a good point to, to yes. I, I suppose, emphasize again. We have released uh, Centaurs and Minotaurs and Unarked Arcana yes. for playtest. We're, we're, we value your feedback. We encourage your feedback. Uh, oh. Go ahead. <laughs> well, I, I want to say what, what it is sort of to get the feedback on. Okay. So what we're experimenting with here, and actually we've done it before, is having you in some cases respond to yourself uh, with a reaction because sometimes we want you to be able to do something, but we don't want you to be able to do it and also take an opportunity attack or do some other reaction thing, partly because we don't want the game to get completely bogged down. Mm -hmm. So this is a way for us to give you something juicy that you can do without, cre without increasing too much the gameplay time overhead uh, at the table. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that, that's our thinking here, uh, that this allows you uh, to layer in uh, this this special hammering horns ability, but then also doesn't eat up your bonus action that you might be using for something else because your class might be giving you bonus actions or whatnot. So that was also part of our thinking mm -hmm. is this also by ha using your reaction instead of a bonus action, it means it's if you're a rogue or something else, it's not killing uh, your bonus action at the same time. Finally, uh, you are menacing and you have proficiency uh, in the intimidation skill. And then we also have, in the new version, uh, the uh, hybrid nature, which is, we, cl we clarify that this playable version of the Minotaur is both a humanoid and a monstrosity. Now this is, <laughs> this is, this is something we haven't done uh, yet in fifth edition of having a creature be more than one type. This is purely an experiment. Mm -hmm. Uh, and although it's an experiment that uh, I'm interested in using for some other things in the game. What, what are you looking to potentially discover via this experiment? So, so sometimes we want creatures to be affected by things that would affect multiple creature types. Mm -hmm. And often we use creature types as a way to sort of wall off certain effects from certain creatures. Mm -hmm. For example, many things in the game, especially many low level like enchantment spells and whatnot, work only on humanoids or humanoids and beasts. Okay. So if a monstrosity walks in, the monstrosity is unaffected by those things. And that's by design. We want actually a lot of low level magic to be ineffective, especially when it comes to mind control effects, shutting other creatures down, to have a harder time shutting down some of these creatures uh, that are a bit more alien, a bit more monstrous. Uh, you know, this is also why a lot of things don't work on constructs and undead. Mm -hmm. it, that also creates some nice texture in the game. It makes it feel like, ooh, these creatures are, are very much unlike these other things. But here's the issue, when you take when you take a creature that may not be humanoid uh, and then make it a playable race, you then basically would be getting a bunch of stealth immunities because there are a lot of things in the game that don't do anything to you if you're not a humanoid right. or, or by extension a beast. Whole person no longer is applicable. Right, exactly. Uh, and 
but it's not only it's not only us being concerned about a bunch of sort of stealth immunities. Uh, it it's also uh, about wanting humanoid things to work on you, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. both positive and negative. And so that's why the way we word this is you can be affected by a game effect if it works on either of your creature types. Okay. So if, it, if there is a spell that does a positive or negative thing to humanoids, mm -hmm. it's going to work on you. If there is a forbidden spell that hedges out monstrosities, well, that's also going to work on you. Uh, now, you can imagine, let's say we were, we were doing the player's handbook today, you can imagine us using this kind of tech, even potentially for like elves, because we've often said elves have fey ancestry. Right. Well, we could it, and f instead actually say they are humanoids and fey. Uh, but we'll see. We'll see how this experiment goes. <laughs> uh, again, I have I have other things um, I would like to do with it because okay. because there are there are a number of unusual uh, species in a variety of D and D worlds where this kind of game design tech would be very useful to us okay. to be able to say you're you're more than one thing at once. Uh, what I was jumping on before, and I might be speaking out of turn, but uh, the question had come up about the unearthed arcana material appearing in D&D Beyond. Ah, yes. So I if I'm, unless I'm mistaken, I believe we have sort of an intended one-week uh, mm -hmm. delay period for yep. them to code it in, uh, make sure that it's, it's final and complete before they start on that. So uh, to the best of our knowledge, is that uh, still true to... Uh, yeah, to this the, material? To, to the, the best of our knowledge, okay. uh, the centaur and the minotaur will appear in D&D Beyond, uh, I think, sometime next week. Okay. And I bring it up. Again, we were mentioning uh, this is for playtest, and we encourage playtests. So, of course, if you're making characters in D&D Beyond, by all means, feel free to jump on making new minotaur and centaur characters and, and playtest it out that way. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we had a question uh, about the removal of a labyrinth recall. Ah, yes. So... Let's go back to the original version. Um, so you can, the original Minotaurs from the 2015 version had this labyrinthine recall ability. You can perfectly recall any path you have traveled. So this, it was one of those things where either we were going to have to heavily clarify this or just chuck it, mm -hmm. and we went with chucking it. Um, partly because this is not actually an ability that all Minotaurs in D&D have had. Mm -hmm. uh, this is not something associated with all D&D Minotaurs. Uh, and again, we were striving for something, th we were striving for a version of uh, the Minotaur that would work in many D&D worlds and is sort of a, a synthesis of many of the most iconic elements of a playable Minotaur. But some can lose their car in the mall parking lot. <laughs> yes, yes, <laughs> yes. Got it. Yeah. I mean, because as the original one was written, let's say we did want to have this ability for all Minotaurs, uh, we would need to clarify what do we even mean by path uh, and you know, there, it introduces a number of questions. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah. It makes sense in a way from the mythology of the Minotaur and his particular labyrinth. Yes. But, but what does that mean in game terms? Yes. That it, particular Minotaur. Right. Yes. Right. Yeah. 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 Uh, so, shall we talk about? We don't have a whole lot of time to talk about the centaur. No, uh, we will, uh, as, as mentioned before, we will be coming back. We'll continue this conversation mm -hmm. with uh, Jeremy at a later date. We did touch upon, we finished up the order domain, uh, got through a bit of the minotaur, and we have not even yet touched upon the centaur. I know there are some, uh, some key questions for the centaur. There are, but one of those questions might relate to something that also relates to the minotaur. Uh, so... Uh, is it my favorite question from Sage Advice? Can a centaur climb a ladder? <laughs> no, it's not that one. 
but, but we should we should delve into that uh, next time when we talk more about the centaur. Uh, Which question would cross over between the two? Is it, it has to do with size. Okay. Yes. 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 So uh, minotaur, the monstrous minotaur, as I mentioned earlier, is large. Yes. Uh, and uh, the playable minotaur is medium. Now we did that partly because uh, medium-sized minotaurs have appeared in D and D art before, uh, particularly in Dragonlance, but actually mm -hmm. in art for other settings as well. Yeah. Uh, so there's that. We have already established over the course of the game's history that not all minotaurs are the same size. We also have a preference for player characters to be medium-sized. None of the game to be totally frank, has ever designed with player characters being large in mind, except for temporary periods of time. So, you know, we have the enlarge spell, we have other abilities in the game that will increase your size temporarily. Uh, you can certainly polymorph into larger creatures. Mm -hmm. um, but usually those transformations uh, well, particularly in the case of polymorphing, have trade-offs where your some of your abilities get shut off, uh, etc. Or again, they have the merit of not being permanent. Mm -hmm. Being permanently large introduces a number of design problems uh, that kind of they run the gamut. They they actually touch on many areas of play. Uh, and so I'm just going to touch on just a few of them in, in our in our our, our final minutes today. Sure. So one of them is, is if you are large, first off, uh, the potential number of, if you're using miniatures, so I'm gonna use, uh, it's easier to describe this if I talk about playing on a grid. Mm -hmm. If you're using miniatures, there are way more squares around you uh, into which you can make opportunity attacks uh, than is true for a medium creature. Mm -hmm. If you're using a reach weapon, it gets even crazier if you're large. Because remember, uh, if you're a medium creature, your space is a five foot square. If you're large, it's suddenly a 10 foot square. And then that means any effect that radiates out from you with your entire space as its center, that that effect radiating out just got bigger. Mm -hmm. So that includes the reach of your weapon attacks. That also includes any class feature, like a paladin's auras, that radiates out like 10 feet from you. Well, a 10-foot aura radiating out from a large creature uh, is actually covers way more squares mm -hmm. than that same 10-foot aura radiating out from a medium creature. Uh, similarly, any spell effect that radiates out from the spellcaster, uh, the effective area uh, of that spell is far larger mm -hmm. if the spellcaster is large rather than medium. Mm -hmm. And it just goes on and on like that. There are this sort of ripple effects through the game where increasing a player character size uh, it really presses into the fact that, again, we didn't design the game for player characters of that size. I, I was even thinking from it from adventure design standpoints, there, that, where you know, the that corridors dimension. and, and doors and mm -hmm. things of that nature are, are most likely designed for medium character parties to, to, to be exploring. Yeah. I mean, a large creature can uh, block many typical hallways on their own. Mm -hmm. Now, the downside for them is it also means they're a big target. Right. Uh, it also means far more foes can also swarm around a large creature. Mm -hmm. That's, and again, I could go on. This is, the, these aren't even all of the issues. Uh, it just basically, <laughs> there are so many issues around uh, having a character who is permanently large uh, that it's honestly not, it's, it's not really worth it mm -hmm. um, from a design perspective. And, but luckily for us, we have precedent for medium-sized minotaurs, uh, and so we just, well, these ones that you play are medium. Mm -hmm. uh, because we, we have already established in D&D &D that uh, not every player character is like every NPC or monster of the same uh, species. So you see this even with some of the options in the player's handbook. If you look at the drow, for instance, that you can play from the player's handbook, you, there is not a one-to-one -one correspondence between everything the drow can do in the pH with each of the drow stat blocks that are in the monster manual. Sure, right. And again, that is on purpose. We, we 
in, in fifth edition, when we give you a race option, we are not saying every member of the race has these traits. What we're saying is player characters of this race have these traits. Mm -hmm. But there are, of course, many other members of your species who might, have, might be missing some of these traits, might have other traits, uh, might be of a different size. Uh, we also show this in the NPC appendix of the Monster Manual, where you'll notice that the NPCs don't have races indicated. Uh, that a DM, if they want, can you know, take the uh, priest or noble or any other uh, NPC stat block from the Monster Manual appendix and just say it's a dwarf or say it's an elf and not change anything about that stat block. Now we tell you in the Monster Manual, if you'd like, you could add some traits specific to that person's species if you wanted to, uh, but it's not necessary because again, we, we are not meaning to suggest that everyone who's a member of a particular race in our game is exactly alike. Mm -hmm. Uh, so uh, we're getting on three o'clock, and there are some great questions. Uh, <laughs> a lot of questions about centaurs and paladins and mounts and uh, mm -hmm. things of that nature that I think we'll probably end up uh, saving for uh, for our next discussion, uh, if that works for you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, three o'clock here. I will mention just a couple of uh, bits of announcement. Of course, the stream of many eyes. Uh, as we have announced at uh, dnd.wizards.com slash SOME uh, has information available about everything taking place. We'll be adding a day-by-day -day schedule coming soon. Uh, we still have the four ticketed Sunday games are up. You can buy tickets for, for now. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, you will be attending the Stream of Many Eyes? I'll be there. Wonderful. Yeah. All right. Uh, so Jeremy Crawford will be, uh, will be on hand down in Los Angeles. I look forward to it. Uh, Dragon Plus, the next issue, uh, issue 20, I believe, will be coming out at the beginning of June, right after the stream of Many Eyes, to also take a look at some of the coverage. We were interviewing some of the Dungeon Masters in advance about the games they were running, interviewing some of the folks, helping put it all together to, uh, to take a look at it. Uh, let's see, any other uh, news or announcements before we go on? We do have D&D News coming up at 3.30 with Greg Tito and Dice Camera Action, who will also be at the stream of Many Eyes uh, with Chris Perkins at 4 p.m. Pacific, uh, as, as always. So, uh, so next week for Dragon Plus, we will be returning with our May Dungeons and Doodles episode. We'll have uh, Danny Hartel in as a featured guest artist and I believe Matt Cavada from the Magic Team. Uh, will also be joining us. Uh, and then uh, in a couple of weeks, uh, perhaps we'll be able to return and talk about the, the centaurs yeah. Yeah. and uh, finish up before we, we jump on an airplane to, uh, to sunny Los Angeles. Uh, and and uh, yes, so we, we, we barely got through all of the questions I had. I know we did not cover uh, nearly as many questions as the folks in the audience had, so we will go through, uh, scrub some of the questions so that we can ask them of, of you next time. Uh, and yes, we, we did not even get to which one would you rather have as a roommate, a centaur or a minotaur? But, uh. Oh, <laughs> it, de it depends on the size, it depends on the <laughs> dimensions of the room. See, again, it goes back to medium or large. Uh, no, like, no, I'm thinking of just, again, the, the, the proportions. <laughs> Oh, like high ceilings. Yeah, yeah, there yeah, you go. yeah. <laughs> well, thanks as always for uh, spending time with us on the Dragon Plus live stream. Uh, thank you to everyone who takes the time to, to watch. Uh, thank you so much to our followers and subscribers. Uh, if you are down in the Los Angeles area, please do consider purchasing a ticket for any of the Sunday games. Uh, it's going to be quite, quite the fun spectacle, so we certainly encourage you to, uh, to, to join us. Otherwise, we'll be live streaming all three days right here on the D&D Twitch channel. Uh, and that's that's my uh, my advertorial for for this week. <laughs> All right, everyone, we'll be back at three thirty with Greg Tito and D and D News, and uh, we'll see you next uh, next week on Tuesday. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone.